to spend a few words. Okay, so there is recording. Um, I'm very happy to, 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 to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I will be here just uh, for, for the start because I have quite a few other commitment and meeting that are much less agreeable than, than being with you. Uh, LMEC is, is a, a very important program for, for the Department of Economics. Uh, so you know, I think very well, the history of the program. The program not only was one of the leading uh, uh, opening programs that actually brought uh, the University of Bologna first, but many other departments in Italy to, to reshape and rethink uh, masters in international dimension and eventually also a two years degree in a international dimension. This, we, we were the leader on that. Uh, many of you were involved since the very beginning and many of you were actually uh, used uh, in these, uh, the early experimentation where we invented uh, many, many interesting things. Um, the LMAC is really part of our identity. It's still today, I think, uh, uh, when we think about big undertaking and uh, still today when we every day think about what can we do more in terms of teaching, in terms of research, recruiting, forming economists, uh, we, we still look at LMAC as a part of uh, the way we, we uh, we think about uh, the Department of Economics. So it, it's really an identity uh, program. Um, it already produced very successful scholars. Many, many are here. Uh, many are relatively young and they are starting their economic career. May, some of them, uh, including Danny that I see here that will join us as, uh, or Enrico Cantoni, some of them are not so young any longer <laughs> and they are already quite experienced. But uh, you see, the LMAX already produced very successful economists. Uh, and this contributes a lot, I think, to the way in Europe and in the world the department is perceived. Uh, so all these people that uh, were growing into the program, uh, I think they, they help us a lot. And uh, that is, I, I spent quite, quite some time in the last few years working on recruitment, try to also do a better recruitment of uh, uh, assistant professor, professor. And I have to say that the fact of having the LMAC as being considered a very successful program always helped. This is a very nice way of presenting the department even abroad. Um, so this is, this is something that is very important for us. Um, Another important part of the LMAC is uh, that uh, it never rests. So we are, we are on a path of perpetual innovation. We are never happy. Uh, we face a lot of competition. You know, there are many other programs that uh, with many more resources that uh, have been popping up in the international uh, arena and competitors. Uh, sometimes we struggle, but we never give up. Uh, so the idea is really to keep moving and improving all the time. This is something that I like a lot uh, because a lot of people put a lot of effort and they really feel part of, of, of a, bit, a bit of a mission and to, to stay together. I would really just like to conclude by saying that if I go through the list of people that I see in the background, unfortunately we can't meet, but I really, I really have the impression that many of these people contributed to, to all together in different ways, students that, that eventually become scholars, some, some become colleagues, uh, people that started uh, teaching in LMAC very young and have been growing with the program themselves. I really see something like a big family. And uh, in fact, I see many friends. Unfortunately, and this is the only regret that I have today, Unfortunately, we cannot be there in person, sharing a few beers and some wine. And this is a big regret for me right now. But I really hope that uh, this reunion, even, even if virtually, help us in strengthening our network and, 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 and keeping the, the idea of keep moving and can keep pushing. So really, thanks a lot. Uh, I have to leave you, but I leave you in good hands. Thank you.
Thank you, Matteo. Thank you. And now, Chiara Monfardini, so the former LMEC director, will say a few words, so a second welcome address. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you, Francesca. Okay, let me start by greeting all of you. It's uh, very nice to see you, even uh, on these small pictures. I'm very happy to, to meet you even this way. Uh, I would like to uh, stress again how thankful we have to be to our Francesca for organizing all uh, uh, of this. Uh, and uh, in ELMEC, we have this nice practice as the new director steps in, she or he has to organize the reunion. And this is a bit of a shocking step into, into uh, the, new, uh, the new duty. Uh, and I have clear memories of the effort it requires, but I am convinced that this effort is worth and uh, all these energies are very well invested. Uh, indeed, as uh, Matteo was mentioning, we are uh, always uh, keeping a lot of uh, attention toward this building of an LMEC community. Uh, I also try to do my best in this regard during the three years in which I was coordinating. And uh, it is uh, very important to, to strengthen this uh, relationship within the court of students, uh, between the contiguous court of students, very important uh, that the first year students uh, are in contact with second year students. And of course, uh, between current students and graduates. All uh, this uh, rich capital of relationships is of an extremely high value, uh, both uh, uh, professionally and uh, personally. I think it is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, keeps with you throughout your future life. So, um, Again, I believe uh, this uh, uh, effort is truly uh, worth. Mm, Matteo was already uh, mentioning that for the department, uh, this program is very important. Uh, and uh, uh, we dedicate uh, uh, a lot of our work to, to keep uh, uh, the quality high, to increase uh, its quality. And uh, it is... Uh, uh, nice, I'm happy to, to see that the former uh, LMEC graduates are then joining the departments as colleagues. So we have Enrico that joined us as a research fellow three years ago, but there are two further LMEC graduates joining us the next academic year, Bruno Conte Leite as research fellow, and Danny Tomasi as assistant professor. And I think uh, together with uh, uh, the placement that keeps uh, at a very high level, both academically and in the industry, this uh, uh, testifies that our uh, program uh, is uh, uh, well um, placed uh, and uh, this gives us motivation for us to, to keep on uh, struggling with uh, our uh, dedication. So um, this is uh, my welcome speech uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear from, uh, from you, uh, your uh, intervention, your testimonials about uh, uh, your life after LMEC. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chiara. So now it's my turn. And so I will uh, uh, say a few words uh, and uh, share with you a few images uh, that uh, Federico, uh, Lenti, and uh, Stefano Zolina were so kind to share with me. Uh, let's see whether I'm able to do that. Okay, so why are we here today? So today our purpose is to celebrate the achievements of LMEC graduates and also inspire current students with the presentations and the testimonials of former students. And so first of all, how we can describe LMEC students. So here you see some pictures. So our students are brave, they are tough, and uh, they acquire important skills. And uh, sorry, I don't know how to 
to let you see better. So um, in addition, uh, MX students learn uh, to solve uh, complex uh, problems uh, and uh, they face uh, stressing deadline and uh, they rely quite a lot uh, on takeaway food in this uh, case. And uh, moreover, LMAC uh, students uh, deal with uh, difficult uh, trade-offs and uh, they as uh, many other students uh, had an hard time recently because their social interaction, uh, friendship with classmates, uh, their mutual support and cooperation has become particularly difficult. But uh, we are ready to start uh, in uh, September with uh, in-person relationship again in our classes. And uh, I would like uh, to let you know that LMAC faculty is uh, eager to resume real in-person interactions with students and uh, with uh, LMAC friends. And uh, talking about LMAC friends, I leave uh, immediately the screen uh, to Federica. So Federica is uh, uh, a PhD student at Crest in Paris. She graduated from LMAC in 1917, and she's also chapter leader of the LMAC uh, Student Association. So Federica, the screen is yours. I see somebody asking in the chat who is Federica. Ah, no, sorry. Okay. Um, was joking. Uh, thank you, Francesca, and thanks a lot for organizing this event. And hello, everybody. Um, so I would be very quick because uh, uh, I don't have much to say, but let me first introduce myself. Uh, so my name is uh, Federica Melutti, and I graduated from NMEC in uh, 2017. And I'm right now a PhD candidate in economics at CREST. Uh, which is a joint research center between uh, NSAE and the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Um, and I'm researching in labor economics uh, with a focus on gender inequalities in the labor market and gender differences in job search. Uh, and before that, uh, I had some experiences in international organizations, uh, uh, both at the ECB as a trainee and at the OECD as a policy analyst in the labor division. So this is why I will be uh, chairing the room on public institutions uh, later on in the afternoon. Uh, but before leaving the, the floor to the next speaker, I would like to, to spend some words on the uh, Alumni Association, which was founded by the University of Bologna some months ago. So basically, the University of Bologna is investing a lot of uh, resources and energies in creating a network of its alumni and uh, alumni. Uh, that's why they created a platform that is called the Alme Matris Alumni Association. Uh, so you can uh, type it on the net and look it up. And I really encourage you to subscribe because there's a lot of content. Uh, so for example, there is a mentoring service for current students, there are job offers, there are events and, uh, and many other stuff. And on the left of the platform, you will see there is a list of uh, the existing chapters. And among them, there is one uh, which is called LMAC chapter where we will post uh, in the future uh, content events and so on. So I really encourage you to, to subscribe. I will uh, copy the, the link on the, on the chat as well. Um, and I think I'm done and I can leave the floor to, to the next speaker. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, have a good afternoon. Okay, thank you, Federica. So we can start now with a short presentation by LMAC graduates. So the first speaker is Nora. Nora Kung is now in uh, uh, Vienna at the Agra Graduate School of Economics and she graduated from MMAC two years ago. So, Nora, the screen is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. So, I'm very happy to be here today. As Professor Barikadze mentioned, my name is Nora Kungel, and I am uh, I graduated from AMAC in 2019. And right after graduation, I have started my PhD studies at the Vienna Graduate School of Economics. So I am a second year student now, and I am working on empirical projects in the field of education economics. And since among the speakers today, I am the most recent graduate uh, with Professor Barikadze before that the most insights I can give to the current students is regarding the PhD application and the starting of, uh, of the PhD. So the first question uh, that you as a master student probably ask is whether you should do a PhD and whether you are good enough for a PhD. And I can assure you that most of us had these doubts and we are even having these doubts sometimes during the PhD. 
But my main advice here is that you can never lose anything with trying and applying, especially that uh, you get a lot of support from the faculty in ALMAC in the application process. And in general, I think ALMAC is giving you a good training in terms of um, bearing the pressure and doing hard work during the whole semester. So if you are interested in a topic and you are willing to put in the work, then I'm sure that you are definitely good enough for a PhD. But of course, there are many aspects that you can consider and aspects that will help you to find a program that suits you the best. And uh, for example, I have decided to stay in Europe, even though we know that the best places in terms of rankings are in the US. And I'm sure that the next speakers are going to give you more information uh, on that. But I have decided to stay and I have chosen a program where there is no one or two year course phase, for example, but we start immediately with our own research on the first day, basically. So one thing that you should ask yourself is whether you would like to do more courses or you are eager to jump in your first own research project um, and start writing your dissertation. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer here, but think about it before applying. Probably it's, it's good to know what you prefer. And second, there are larger and smaller programs also within Europe. A smaller program has the advantage of knowing everyone supervisors and uh, the other faculty members having more time to mentor you. I think this is also something that we know very well from, from AMAC and we have experienced already. Um, but of course, a bigger program can probably support you in a wider range of fields. So if you are choosing a smaller program, I would recommend you to gather information before uh, in which fields they are specialized in. The best is always to ask the people who are already studying there or working there. So regarding Vienna, if I would need to say one field, then uh, I would say that it's definitely an IO focused place. So if you know at the end of your master's uh, which field you are mostly interested in, or if you have a strong commitment to one field, then ideally you should choose a place where your interest is in line with the faculty's interest, because this will help you to develop the, the most in that field. Another point I have considered when I was applying was that in Vienna, it's compulsory to do teaching from the second year already. And I think we don't talk a lot about uh, teaching when we are talking about PhD, but if this is something that inspires you, then uh, this is definitely something that you can also consider. It's good to have teaching experience once you are on the market after the PhD, but also I think that it's a very good and unique learning opportunity to learn in a way that you can explain it to others to see the different points of views of the students and mostly to help, to help them to learn something new and to, to help them improve and show them how diverse economics is. And finally, the last question that you probably have, is there um, less pressure in Europe or in smaller programs? I think that there is uh, pressure everywhere. But if you choose a place uh, where you feel comfortable, where the, the program is structured in a way you prefer, then it will help you uh, to do your best. And if there is a topic you really care about, if you are really passionate about, then I think academia is giving you a lot of opportunities to explore that also in Europe. So I hope that I have helped you to shine some light on some factors that you can consider. But Maybe I will leave my contact details in the chat because I also have to leave very soon. But and you can contact me with any questions that you have. So thank you. Thank you, Nara. Thank you so much. So I forgot to say that uh, if anyone uh, wants to jump in and then ask a question to the speaker, please uh, feel fully free to do that. I will be happy and, and uh, we will be happy to, of course. Okay, any question for, uh, for Nora? Okay, thank you again. And so we can now move uh, to Gianni. Giovanni Mattotti is an economic analyst, anal analyst sorry, at the European Commission and uh, he graduated in uh, uh, 2018. 
Uh, here I am, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> so thanks a lot for having me here. I hope you can see the slides. I prepared a couple, a couple yeah, of slides. Yeah, very well, yes. Okay, perfect, thanks. So thanks a lot for having me here. It's very nice to be part of this reunion, although, although it's virtual. So um, I'm Gianni Matozzi and I graduated from El Mac in uh, 2018. And uh, at the moment, I'm working as an economic analyst at the European Commission in Brussels. So let me just do a little recap of what I did uh, after my graduation. Also, if you if you want to take an inspiration for your, your, your future career, basically. So when I was still in El Mac, I was struggling a bit to decide what I wanted to do after. I was uncertain if I wanted to do a PhD or going directly to, to, to work. And I believe that uh, many of you now are in the same situation. In the end, I realized that I didn't want to spend five or more years in the academia uh, because it didn't fully match my career perspectives. And so I went directly to, to the labor market. So immediately after my graduation, I started working for a very interesting uh, startup based in Rome, which was dealing with data science and data analytics. And I've been there for around five months where I did a two months uh, intensive course in data science and a three months internship. Following this, I was uh, selected uh, uh, for the traineeship program at the European Commission and I was a trainee in uh, DG ECFIN, which basically is the Directorate General dealing with economic and financial affairs. And there I mainly work in the macroeconomic forecasting team and in the team dealing with uh, business and consumer surveys. Uh, that was a very technical work, uh, mainly involving the analysis of data, but extremely interesting. Finally, after finishing the traineeship at the Commission, I started working as an intern at the International Labour Organization in Geneva. And that was also a very nice experience, more policy related. I had the chance to work in the field of employment policies. And in particular, since the period of the internship overlapped uh, with, uh, with the beginning of the pandemic, uh, my main task has been monitoring the implementation of policy support measures in the labour market. Uh, uh, with specific regard to, to, to policies that are managed by uh, public employment uh, services. So now um, I came back working at the European Commission, always in, uh, in DG ECFIN, and I finally got my first real contract after one year and more of internships. And uh, yeah, basically I'm working in a very big unit uh, which coordinates the, the, the policy work of the entire directorate. And uh, it is uh, structured in uh, three teams. Uh, the team dealing with the fiscal surveillance, uh, the team dealing with the recovery and residence facility, which is uh, basically the centerpiece of the next generation EU plan. And at this moment, it's the hottest topic on the European agenda. And finally, the, the Euro area team, which is the team I am working in. So there, in terms of the work streams to which I contribute, uh, so um, just to give you a flavor of what we do. Uh, first, we are in charge of uh, developing the Euro area recommendations. And those are basically recommendations written by the European Commission and adopted by the Council after a series of redrafting sessions. And uh, they, they basically prescribe measures that the Eurozone member states should implement in order to, to, to tackle uh, critical issues for the functioning of the Euro Economic and Monetary Union. And uh, they are usually underpinned by an analytical document that we write and goes in more in detail analyzing the economic development uh, occurred in the Euro area in the past year. Secondly, we, we, we also write analytical notes to steer the, the discussion at the political level in the Eurogroup. And here again, the topics discussed are very broad depending on what are the hottest issue in that specific period in time. Uh, we, we recently wrote a note on uh, economic adjustment following the COVID-19 crisis. Now here I put some links. I will share the, the, the slides with Professor Barigotzi if she wants to circulate them and if you want to investigate further. 
Um, thirdly, we, we also coordinate the relations with the OECD and the IMF, in particular with respect to euro area issues. And in this regard, we represent the Commission during the meeting of the OECD Economic Policy Committee, and we are part of the consultations for the OECD survey of the euro area and IMF Article 4 of the euro area. Those are basically two different reports on the euro area, which include recommendations that member, state, member states should undertake. And before the two, two, the two reports are released, the, the two institutions consult the European authorities to get their view on the issues that are discussed. Finally, we, we, we are also at the point of contact for the, the Economic and Financial Committee and uh, the Eurogroup Working Group. Those are two preparat preparatory bodies that prepare the work for the ECOFIN and the Eurogroup. Uh, so I would say this is it from my side. I, I also included a, a final slide where I put several links that you might find uh, useful if you're looking for internship opportunities in Brussels. Uh, I mean, you have internships in the European institutions, but also in the private sector. I mean, Brussels is indeed full of consultancies, uh, institutions, uh, lobbyist association that gravitate around the European bubble. And there are plenty of opportunities if you want to, uh, to start an international career. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Gianni. Thank you for all the precious information. And uh, yeah, uh, your uh, slides uh, will be very, uh, very relevant. So thank you a lot for sharing them. Are there any questions for, uh, for Gianni? Okay, so maybe we can move uh, to the third speaker, who is uh, Giacomo Rubini, now PhD student uh, at Brown University, and Giacomo graduated in 2017. So Giacomo, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Let me share my slides. Mm -hmm. Why it's not working? Okay, nice. Okay, so I will be talking about um, linear path in higher education this day. Uh, it's something I've been working for the, in the past 10 years. So as many of you won't know me, um, I'm a graduate student at Brown University since 2018. Um, and I mostly work in micro theory, so mechanism design, behavioral economics, and experiments. Um, so I joined LMAC in 2015 uh, and I, I had a bit of a different background. So I had an interest in economics in high school. So I made the logical choice and I enrolled in a business undergrad degree, uh, which gave, which I loved a lot. Like uh, I really enjoyed management courses, accounting courses, especially marketing courses. And it gave me a great head start uh, to begin LMAC. Uh, so, you know, I hit the ground running and I had the chance to take all the exams on time and achieving a high GPA, um, you know, to apply for the PhD. Uh, I did some other stuff. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, I graduated actually, I'm, I'm from class of 2017, but I graduated in March 2018. So I had the time to do an Erasmus in Paris at NS Cachon. Um, which was a nice change of scenario. As you know, academia is not the same in every place. Uh, there are different cultures and different ways of, you know, doing things. Uh, and it's really useful to see it with your own eyes because, you know, when you do a PhD, as I did, uh, you change the culture, especially if you go abroad. And it's really useful to know, um, you know, how things are going to work out in other places. Uh, I did also, I also gave a hand at BLESS, which is our experimental lab here in Bologna, uh, which is a you know, great hands on experience, especially because I didn't have any experience with research beforehand. And during the master, you have some, some sort of idealized um, idea of how research works. You don't understand how much running in circles and profanity is involved in the research process. So it's great you know, to start seeing it with your eyes as well. And you know you get some 
uh, you get some experience also with you know the tools of the profession. So in my case, it was Z3, which is the standard software used in uh, to perform economic experiments. Um, I was also a tutor or a teaching assistant. I don't know how it's called in. Uh, uh, in Italy, uh, which is important, especially if you do a PhD, as I think Nora mentioned, there are some PhDs that require you to teach, some that don't. If you uh, want to teach after you know your master's, it's a great experience to um, to be a tutor for a course, especially because it lets you understand how tough it is to uh, to be a teacher. Okay, it's not super easy. It takes a lot of preparation, especially if you want to deliver a good experience to students and to give them exercises that, you know, they will remember fondly and, you know, that they won't cause them any physical pain if they see them after a few years, you know? And I think you love this one uh, in particular. That was great. <laughs> uh, in grad school, so I started grad school in 2018 uh, in 12th grade with the grand background I had from LMAC, you know, um, I didn't have to work much. Professors were very happy with my work, especially in the first part of the program. And, you know, it's, it's a great experience in this, especially when you start doing research on, of, of your own and, you know, you start to delve deep in some research topics and you get a deep understanding of those. Uh, so you know, why all this, uh, all this talk, all this gibberish? Uh, because, you know, I, I had two takeaways from my experience as math. Uh, and I think I can split them in two advice, two pieces of advice for PhD applicants, which are one, take your time, ask yourself if a PhD is what you want to do. And, you know, there are many options. Nobody is better than, than the other. You know, there's no, there's no shame in going to industry or to a government job or whatever. Uh, but really ask yourself what you want to do and, you know, think about it because it's, you know, four to six years of your life. Okay. And it's super okay to stress out in application season. Uh, it's expensive, it's stressful, it's tiring. So don't worry too much about that. It's normal. Everyone feels the same. And please do remember that PhD ranking is one thing, you know, and doesn't mean anything about your value. And it doesn't mean anything on how well you will be in the PhD. Okay. So Try to find a place where you fit in, you know, where which is a culture that you think uh, will be the one in which you will work best and, you know, that you will enjoy. Because after all, it's it's a job, but it's also uh, something you should like, um, or hopefully. Uh, so for those beginning grad school this, uh, this fall, so my condolences, uh, you will screw up at some point. There's no way around that, so let, let's put things out immediately. Uh, but it's okay. It's normal. It's how it's supposed to be. So, you know, uh, acknowledge your failures. Okay? Research is made of repeated failures that at some point turn out to be a good idea. Uh, if you need to do panic, panic, it's fine. And then move on. Okay, so listen to the advice of your faculty, you know, of your professors, of your friends, of your mentors especially of your uh, advisors, because, you know, if they are tenured professors and you're not, there's for sure a reason, okay? Uh, so thank you for listening to this uh, gibberish talk for like five minutes and a half. And if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I leave you my email in the chat. Um, and that's just, I, I would say. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you for those uh, very inspiring words. And uh, are there any question for, uh, for Giacomo. In the meanwhile, I would like to share a picture with you here. Giacomo, during his <laughs> period as a teaching assistant for the, uh, for the course uh, in game theory. And so you can see how much <laughs> students who are respecting him. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Indeed, Giacomo was a great, really a great teaching assistant, and he also received a special recognition from the department for his excellent activity as a, as a teaching assistant. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Um, so if you don't have uh, other questions, 
I know it's sharing the screen. Oh no. Sorry, I know it's, yes. I stopped sharing the screen. And uh, I'm presenting the next uh, speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Gemma Di Poppa. She's uh, a postdoctoral fellow in political science at Stanford University. And she graduated from M M MEC in 2014. So thank you, Gemma, for accepting my invitation to speak today. And the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Francesca, for inviting me. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, nice to meet some of you. Nice to see some of you again after many years. Uh, my name is Gemma. I'm uh, one of the old people uh, presenting so far. I'm from the class of 2014. And uh, right now, I'm a postdoc at Stanford, which is uh, where I'm calling you from now. Uh, so apologies if I look a bit asleep, but it's, uh, it's early. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'll tell you a bit what happened in between uh, Bologna and uh, here in California. Um, so right after LMAC, uh, I had the luck of being hired as a research assistant by Professor Enrico Cantoni, that at the time was a PhD student at MIT, and for us students was the absolute star of LMAC, the person that we were all looking to. Uh, and I was hired to work in a randomized experiment in which we were doing door-to-door -door canvassing in Casalecchio together with politicians. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, and it was, for me, a super important experience because uh, I mean, not only we made it to the news, uh, also to the news of Casalecchio and Valsamoggia, but uh, we also, uh, I mean, I also had the opportunity to see a bit more what it is to do economic research and to realize that it is, uh, you know, there is really a lot of topics that you can work on, including politics. So this, let's say, uh, this experience inspired me to continue doing research. Uh, and so in the same year, I found a job as a RA in uh, Paris, at the Paris School of Economics. And then I applied uh, to PhDs. And so from 2015, I started a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And then, you know, I continued uh, looking for occasions to travel. So in 2018, I did a visiting period at uh, Harvard and U Chicago. And uh, uh, from 2020, I started this postdoc at Stanford, uh, political science always. And uh, I've actually only moved here uh, a month ago because it has been closed so far. But I'm very happy to have moved. It's super beautiful where I am. It's super sunny all the time. Um, I guess the only thing is that there are very few Italians. So now the only bad thing is that the Italy game, I'm going to watch it with a bunch of French people, uh, which at least are, are supporting Italy this time. <laughs> but you know, you do what uh, with what you got. Um, and uh, the topics I'm working on are organized crime, migration, and government responsiveness, which uh, is what I was interested in from the very beginning. So I'm super happy that I get to work uh, on this stuff that I love. Okay, uh, I'm also going to give you some, uh, uh, you know, takeaways I got from applying to PhD programs, and many of these things are going to echo the things that other people have said. Um, but the first and most important thing I would like to say is do not not apply to a PhD program because you think it's too good for you. This is really the biggest mistake you can do in the application process, and uh, I was going to do it. I was not even sure I wanted to apply to PhDs, even though I wanted to do it, because you should know I was not at all one of the best in my course. I was really not at all one of the of the good students, but uh, you know I was very passionate about it. And uh, some of my friends that were doing PhDs already convinced, me, basically forced me to try and apply to places, and in the end I got in the best place that I had applied to. So basically, you don't know. Uh, before applying, uh, you are not able to judge uh, how well it's going to go, you know, if uh, you're going to get into the place that you want to. So the most stupid thing is to not try and apply to the places that you want to go to. Um, and another thing that uh, also others have said, and I've uh, realized talking to other people doing the LMAC, is that the LMAC really prepares you well for PhDs. Once you get in, you're quite in a good situation. So with all this information in mind, you should, uh, you should apply for whatever uh, thing you like, whatever you want. Another thing that is more based uh, you know, on the US is that in my experience, at least, um, the idea that you know, the US programs are much more competitive, there is an environment that is a bit stressful, uh, is a bit of generalization. Of course, it depends on the department. There are a few departments, I would say, where this is true. 
but in my experience and you know you've seen the places where i've been there is not at all this type of a negative competition in which uh, people try to overcome each other surpass each other uh, if anything what the type of competition that there is is that you see you have colleagues that are very clever and so you see that they do very cool work uh, and you also want to do cool work but i would say this is a type of competition that is nice to have uh, in the sense that it pushes you to do your best not to you know uh, stress out about the others and then the final thing uh, is that uh, and this based uh, obviously of my experience as a person that uh, went to political science is that uh, there is really no predefined route and you should not be afraid to change path to follow whatever you're interested in and changing path to follow what you like is actually something that has super high rewards because you know doing what you care about is really what you know gets you working longer hours makes you have the best ideas and uh, you know in general is uh, rewarding even when motivation is low for other reasons so uh, just you know try to follow whatever you think uh, you're really interested in studying, you're really interested in, uh, in doing, uh, and I think that's the best choice you can do. And uh, that's it. We have more time later in the Q&A, uh, but also if you want to talk about something in particular, please uh, email me as well, and uh, I'm very happy to chat more. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. So as Gemma was uh, mentioning, you will have the opportunity later on uh, to ask uh, questions uh, to her and uh, Enrico for uh, uh, an interview that uh, they uh, will uh, be available to, to have with uh, current uh, students uh, and all of you. Okay, so now I think we can move uh, to Ellen. So Ellen Keen Redpath uh, is uh, uh, working as a senior director and economist uh, at uh, FTI Consulting, which is located in Cape Town, and she graduated uh, in uh, 2013. And uh, so, Ellen, the screen is uh, yours, and thank you so much uh, for accepting my invitation to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. I appreciate the invite, and it's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, definitely some faces that are familiar from, from earlier years. It's really wonderful. So lovely to hear you, Gemma. Um, and that was so inspiring. And, and Giacomo, it was just so relatable, really fantastic. So yeah, congratulations to all of you who have already completed LMEC. And I'm really thinking of all of you who are in LMEC right now. I have a lot of respect and admiration, and I think it's also a very different um, experience during, during COVID. So I have a lot of admiration for that. And I'll mention a few words about myself, my career. I'm going to keep it very informal. I'm not going to share a presentation. Um, today is really about you, but of course we can get in touch afterwards if I can help you in any way. My career since LMEX, so the last eight years, has been in competition and regulation. Uh, competition in the US, you would know as antitrust. Um, so I'll say a few words about this, basically um, by keeping it very simple. The competition side is really um, split into two parts. Uh, some of it is legal cases, like where there are big uh, mergers. I think everyone knows about that. Also cases like abuse of dominance, price fixing, collusion cases, market allocation cases. So these are all legal cases where the economists would uh, come in and help. Um, and then the other side of it is more proactive. It's about market inquiries where you're looking at a market uh, going forward, trying to understand how does this market work? How can it work better? I think all of you are probably well aware of all the digital market inquiries happening around the world um, uh, recently and still to date. And the main aim of all of this is, is, if you want to think about like what is the point of all of it, is really to make sure that companies can compete fairly and also to make sure that consumers are able to get the best prices and the best quality. That is, of course, very idealistic, but this is what we work toward. And very practically, on, on a daily basis, the work um, is a, a lot to do with analysis, um, a lot of econometrics in some cases, um, a lot of report writing, but also, I would say, a huge amount of critical thinking, logical thinking, 
Um, I wouldn't discount that at all. And of course, a lot of engagement, um, it's definitely not something that you can do in any sort of isolated fashion. It's very interactive. Um, so yeah, this is a little bit, hopefully um, something grabs your attention um, that you might find interesting. And I'll, I'll perhaps just outline four reasons why I think it's an exciting space to consider if you haven't already. Um, so yeah, the first, the first reason is that I think you get exposure to many sectors, whether you in this space might want to work for a company. Um, I can name many companies in different countries if you, if you like, many of them are global. So if you want to work for a private company in the space or if you want to work for a regulator, um, I think to my knowledge in all these spaces, you have the option of getting exposure to many different sectors. So it's not as if you will be really an expert in one particular field, you might end up knowing digital markets, industrial markets, food markets across the board. Um, so you can really get a lot of exposure and I think that um, I find quite exciting. Um, another big reason is that it's a very much an evolving space. So if you are um, a recent graduate or first you know, decade of your career and you enter into the space, I think there's a lot of scope for you to contribute as a young person because everybody is figuring out how things are working, especially now um, where tech markets are becoming so prominent, digital markets are becoming so prominent. All competition economists, competition lawyers should, in my view, be rethinking everything. They should be questioning whether the tools we have are sufficient or not, or how do we approach, you know, um, these markets that are tipping or being tipped. Um, and I don't, in my view, I don't think anybody has all the answers. So as a, an entrance, I think there's a lot of scope to contribute, and that should be very attractive. That being said, I think it's definitely a space where you have to keep up, you have to keep pace. So um, I think this should be hopefully the case for all economists, but um, it's definitely an area where every year you should be developing um, you know, both your domain knowledge and also your skills as well. And a third reason is that it's very interdisciplinary. I've noticed that even the private firms are now, whereas before they would recruit economists, they're now recruiting computer scientists, data scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, like engineers, across the board engineers. Um, so I think this makes it more competitive in some ways that you're competing with people you thought you will never compete with. But it also I find is quite motivating in that you may get to uh, upskill and cross skill yourself in ways that you never dreamed of within certain positions. So that's quite great. And also, it's very interdisciplinary in that um, I, I think this shouldn't be new information to you, but uh, a competition or regulatory economist, um, as I mentioned, will never work in isolation. We work very closely with competition lawyers, both attorneys and advocates. Um, and then obviously with the clients who in their own right are experts in their field. And so, I mean, it's very much a team effort in every instance. Um, yeah, that's really important. So if you like cross-skilling and um, learning from other people, it's a great space. And the final reason I would say is it's a very global space. Um, as I mentioned, many of the big firms operate across the globe and there are many firms also that operate across Europe. And there's a lot, I would say, a lot of transfer, transferable uh, knowledge and skills. So if you work, say, for a regulator in one country, the chance of you having enough um, knowledge uh, to transfer to a different regulator or to transfer from a regulator to a private um, firm uh, or across countries as well, across countries, across continents, um, in my view, you would need to obviously... Um, upskill a bit uh, to get in there, but I think you would not be limiting yourself in any way geographically. So yeah, I'd say these are four big reasons. The fact that you get exposure to many sectors, it's very much an evolving space, interdisciplinary and very global. Um, so if you haven't considered the, the space, I would encourage you to do so. And I'd be very happy to soundboard with any of you, if you like, uh, if this is of at all of interest to you. I'll stop here and hand back to you, Francesca. Thanks so much. 
Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much. Indeed, I, I have a question. So I, I look at your uh, website, which is a reach uh, of your uh, articles uh, and thoughts. Let's see whether I can find it. Uh, yeah, I make it bigger. Where is it? Uh, here. And so I, I saw this uh, very interesting um, piece uh, in which uh, you talk about uh, there is uh, no such thing as a woman's experience in the workplace. Uh, so I was curious to ask you something about, uh, about this article. Sure. Um, is a particular question or should I just address it? Just uh, what is uh, the point uh, you, you make in this uh, article? Because I, I share your view and uh, I like it very mm -hmm. much. Mm, mm, mm. So I wrote this article because we had a big drive this year for International Women's Day. I think it's in March. Um, and, and that was sort of my view. Um, you're welcome to all read. I write some articles in my personal capacity on Medium, which I enjoy a lot. I love writing. I also write about some uh, cool competition uh, topics there, all in my personal capacity. So you're welcome to take a look. Um, I think maybe the, the most relevant thing I'd like to mention is together with the fact that the, um, the space that I'm speaking about, competition and regulatory economics, is very evolving. Um, I think a relevant point that article linked to what we're discussing here is that this field is also in many jurisdictions fairly new. In South Africa, um, there are actually a lot of women in the field for the reason that the field is only about um, formerly about 22 years old. So actually compared to other areas where there are a lot of uh, legal um, sides to it, um, I would definitely say there are a lot more women and it would also be very encouraging for, for younger people to also enter into this space. Um, yeah, I think um, my, I mean, I, I'm very um, pro everyone from every background participating in a market. I, I'm, I feel, I guess, quite strongly about gender, but uh, gender is, I think, one of many, many, many uh, diverse points across um, age as well and um, country of origin, culture, religion, all sorts of different things. And I think the more different diverse voices you can bring to a market, the more useful often the output can be. So, yeah, maybe that's a few words to inspire you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. Very inspiring. Yes, indeed. Uh, okay, so now we can move to the um, the last speaker for the short presentation. So Paolo, Paolo Tripodi now is working in Unicredit and his expertise is on capital management. But before that, he did many other uh, things, interesting things that he's going to to tell you about. So the the share is your, uh, sorry, I'm still sharing the screen, okay. Thank I'm you. Of... Okay. Okay, hi. So hi everyone, thank you, thank you Francesca. Uh, it's very nice to, to be here and to see to see all of you. Uh, it's good to represent the class of 2012, which I don't think there's a lot of people here except the one guy in the video which is jumping up and down, but uh, he's shy, so I'll have to represent the class for today. <laughs> Uh, so uh, let me tell you a few words about about my career. As some of the other speakers, I'm uh, I'm in the private sector. I didn't join academia. I didn't move on to academia after the LMEC, and I'll, maybe I'll briefly touch on that at the end. Uh, what I did I, after graduation, I joined Unicredit, which is a large bank here in Italy. Uh, I joined in the strategic consulting department, which is a bit of a strange thing. So basically, I was in a bank, but what I was doing was strategic consulting. So basically running projects for top management and uh, in theory, getting getting stuff done or at least trying to get uh, trying to get stuff done uh, across a bit all the areas of the bank. It's quite interesting because it allowed, allowed me to get a perspective of uh, many areas, the different geographies in which Unicredit is in, because it's also in Germany, in Austria, and in Eastern Europe. So see, see quite a few things there. Uh, then I actually moved to investment banking, still within Unicredit. 
uh, and then also for a period in another bank, in a French bank, in Societe Generale. Uh, and investment banking, I was uh, in a specialist team covering financial institutions. So basically, we uh, our clients were other banks, insurers, and so on. And our task was to well, simplifying it to sell stuff, but more interestingly to analyze their balance sheets, see what they could could, could be interesting for them, provide uh, you know pitch maybe M and A deals, that sort of thing. So basically the investment banking world on the private side so not trading on the markets but do, doing structured operations and that uh, on, the, on the capital markets operations after that uh, i got a bit sick sick of investment banking uh, because uh, the path forward was very relationship management oriented and less technical and i'm more of a technical person i like to speak with people but i like also to delve into the numbers and i actually moved back to unicredit so it's a, that's a spot for always leave uh, never burn your bridges behind you you never know when they could come useful to and now i'm in the capital management unit which is basically in charge of uh, well, you know, capital is very important for banks uh, from a regulatory point of view. So uh, the ECB is, uh, uh, well, it's not in my house yet, but almost uh, making sure that we have respect to all the criteria on capital limits and so on. And the job of my team is to interact with regulators and interact with the bank and making sure that our capital ratios are respected at the same time trying to maximize the use of the capital itself in a shareholders perspective let's say to maximize the value that we're getting out of the capital that we our lovely investors have uh, given to us uh, this is a bit of the overview of my career the reason i didn't move to uh, didn't go on for a phd which was what what most of the my class did uh, with uh, with very good results i would say i didn't just uh, because i didn't uh, uh, i simply didn't feel it was my path in terms, I didn't think research was uh, this uh, sort of thing I could commit to. Uh, I change interests too quickly, and I don't think uh, the rigorous process of uh, research was not something that was really suited for me. And I preferred to move to the, and I don't regret the choice, move to the private sector, where there's maybe a bit, uh, things can be maybe a bit, can change maybe a bit more quickly you can you don't need maybe to commit to a paper for a long period but you can you see things more more different different things in a in a faster fashion um in terms of advice for for current uh, for current students uh, um well of course i can give you advice on the on the private side uh, i i want to be very frank what has elmec given to me that i've been used used in my career from the technical point of view, nothing. I've never, never done a regression in my job. I tried to do it once. Everybody started shouting, no, don't do that, don't do that. But um, uh, that's not the point. I mean, I, ne I never used the applied skills because those applied skills are stuff you use in academia you, or you use in some specific sectors, which I saw some, which some of the people here described, where you do actually economic analysis. I don't do economic analysis, I do other stuff. But LMAX still gave me a lot. And what did it give to me? Uh, it gave me on the side, on the skills. So not the hard knowledge. Of course, you need to know a bit how the economy works to do my job, but that's stuff you can also learn elsewhere. But what it really gave me is uh, stuff like uh, uh, taking in information quickly. I mean, I don't know how it is now. In my days, there were quite a few exams and quite a few papers to read for them. And uh, you'd have to do it quickly. You have to understand how stuff works quickly. And that is something that is super useful in any workplace. It gave me understanding of complexity because uh, an economic model can be complex, uh, but also a back office process can be complex. And to have the right vision to understand complex matters and to understand how uh, different parts of mechanism move uh, separately, but sometimes have second, third, 15th order effects on uh, the stuff you're working on is very important. And I think LMAC really gives you that perspective that is good everywhere. You don't need to, you, if you learn in it in an econometric paper, it doesn't mean you can't apply it very well into, in the financial markets or in a strategic consultancy project or as I'm doing now in understanding how to allocate capital inside a large financial institution. So my message on that side is don't think that because you're in a 
course, which is quite rightly targeted towards the academic uh, an academic career, that you don't also have quite a lot of options on the private side if you ever want to explore those. And of course, uh, some of you already I spoke with in the past, you're free to contact me. I'll leave my email here as well if you ever want some advice. I'm a bit old now, but I'll try to I'll try to remember how it was when I started. And uh, and that's it for me. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you a lot. Uh, are there any questions for Paolo? Okay. So thank you again to all the speakers. So now I think we can move uh, to our interview. So um, I thanks uh, Eugenio and Camilla, who will be representative of the current LMAX students and who will interview Gemma and the Fico. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Professor. And uh, thanks a lot also to Enrique and Gemma to, for your time today. And uh, let me say that we are uh, really interested to, uh, to listen about your feedbacks uh, uh, regarding uh, your academic career. And um, so we prepare uh, a couple of questions to both of you, and then uh, we will see also. I mean, I hope that from the public there will be some others uh, uh, doubts uh, that uh, for you. And uh, so first, I would like I would like to ask uh, to Jim. Um, basically, what are the main uh, criteria you base your choice uh, on when applying for a PhD? And if uh, uh, there are some um, specific uh, differences uh, between uh, uh, a PhD program in the United States and a PhD program in, uh, in Europe that uh, made you decide at the end to travel uh, to the United States. So thanks. Hello, thank you so much, Eugenio, for uh, this question, for, uh, for inviting me also to respond. Um, so I would say I would basically agree with what Nora uh, has said in the beginning in terms of choosing which program to go to, uh, because I think that if you have already some idea of what are the things that you're interested in doing in the PhD, then it might be, uh, you know, a clever strategy to do a bit of research on which departments are the ones that, uh, you know, are specialized in, uh, in this type of things. Uh, so I don't know, I do political economy. So for me, uh, it was a good idea to apply to the departments that I knew had a strong uh, faculty component uh, from this, you know, in this discipline. So I think, uh, you know, and this research, of course, is difficult to do by yourself. You cannot Google this type of information. So this is why we have the LMAC reunion. You should email the people uh, in this group and ask information to them, and they probably have uh, a better sense of what are the departments that you should try to apply to. Um, so I think this is uh, this is really one of the criteria that are important. Um, and then, so I mean, to be honest, when I applied for PhD, it's not like my I had super clear ideas of what I was doing. I applied both in the US and in Europe. I applied both to econ and political science programs. But then um, I thought, first of all, that I already had a clear idea of what I wanted to do. Uh, so I didn't really want to retake all the courses. I rather wanted to focus on the courses that uh, I cared about, which were more, you know, uh, econometrics, applied economics, uh, in econ and in political science, the topics that I was interested in. So that's what I did. Um, and in these political science programs, let give you a bit more flexibility in the sense that you do not have to follow the, you know, uh, the sequence. You can rather choose a bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, why the US in the end? Because I think, um, well, okay, first of all, I don't know how PhDs are in Europe, so I cannot really tell for sure. But I think one thing that might be true is that the US generally have more money, so they can give you more resources for research. Uh, if you need to do some type of project that requires, uh, you know, for example, an experiment or hiring uh, research assistants. So this might be an advantage that, uh, that people in the US have. And then, um, at least for me, because I was based uh, in the Northeast of the US, uh, I think there is really a big uh, community in terms of networking. So this is also something that uh, it's a, a big, big advantage that you only realize later 
you get to meet a lot of people that do research uh, in your same field and this really helps you both in terms of finding co-authors and in terms of uh, being exposed to the you know cutting edge uh, type of research that people do so i would say if there is any advantage to the us uh, is this uh, but again i don't know and it's certainly not quality because quality there are extremely good people both in the us and in, and in europe so i don't think that's uh, that's the reason to go to the us that's my take okay thank you so basically networking and your money I think yes. so, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. And then the disadvantage is food, of course. Yeah. yeah. If I may add a couple of words, uh, of course, I have, thank God, I've taken only one PhD. I have taken only one PhD in the United States, so I don't know what my life would look like if I had taken a PhD in Europe. But at least anecdotally, my perception is that there is a, um, a bit more standardization in how uh, PhD programs, especially in economics, are structured in the United States. So there is a uh, almost universally uh, the agreement that a PhD is at the very least a five-year program. Uh, now there is a convert in the United States, there is a convergence towards uh, six years, whereas in Europe uh, and of which the first year is usually just classes. The second year is maybe some classes with a transition towards uh, research and then third year onward, uh, research, research, research with uh, uh, some work to uh, support your uh, tuition, support your, uh, get some, some funding, okay? In Europe, uh, there is much more variability. So maybe in some countries, actually a PhD is like a very well-paid job. In some other countries, you are actually almost a homeless person, okay? It depends, there is a lot of variability, both in terms of the duration of the program, uh, the type of uh, funding that you may expect to receive from uh, the program or from the country, Whereas in the United States, you kind of have the expectation that, yes, it's going to be a job, uh, de facto, a very poorly paid job uh, almost throughout the United States, but at least a job nonetheless, so you will be, you will be paid. So there is more standardization in terms of uh, uh, economic treatment and the structure of the program. Okay, thank you. And uh, first of all, I thank uh, Enrico and uh, Gemma to be here and to us and to um, answer our questions. My first question is for Enrico uh, and concern your personal experience during your PhD at MIT. Uh, in, particular, in particular, I would like to know what was your relationship with your advisors during your years and uh, in general, how much support and contact in, um, should the student expect both, both from a research point of view and administrative uh, point of view? Uh, so um, students should expect to be independent or directed uh, during the way. So that's my question. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Of course, uh, I wouldn't necessarily extrapolate from my experience or from my program to the other programs because uh, there is in the United States a little bit of heterogeneity in terms of how much uh, PhD focused the different departments are. So I was lucky to go to a place that was uh, uh, fairly PhD focused, that is a department that follows very few undergraduate students and has disproportionately more PhDs, which means that the uh, faculty's attention is basically almost 100% on the PhDs. That's great. Uh, if you like, if you enjoy the idea of uh, talking to your advisors very often, in my case, it was uh, independent. So there were some, I had, I mean, the usual PhD committee consists of uh, three advisors. So I had, uh, and usually what happens, I don't know if it is by design or by chance, you have a bad cop, a good cop, and an intermediate cop. I had a bad cop, a good cop, and an intermediate cop. So, I mean, uh, both the bad cop and the good cop and the intermediate cop were very helpful in that their, their type of advice is uh, were, uh, oftentimes complementary to one another. All of them were uh, super qualified to give me um, research-related advice, but, uh, but sometimes they are, they are tough. Uh, they are tough, they are very dear. One of my advisors in particular had this very, um, he was very sincere, which is a fantastic characteristic, but he would tell me things. He would say, you need to do this. There is no other way around. And sometimes, at least at the beginning for me, it was uh, really hard to receive a very, very direct advice. But then I learned, uh, I learned the, the way to, to appreciate the type of advice. So it's a learning experience. Um, and in the end, I, I, I did, uh, I found a way to get the best out of, out of this. 
But uh, it is fundamental that whenever a person hits a, a stopping uh, point during the PhD, they do talk to their advisor, okay? The advisor can be gentle, can be less gentle, can be very abrupt, but independently of what the personality of the advisor is, independently of whether uh, you share the same viewpoint of your advisor in terms of where your research should go, if you hit a stopping point, if you get to a point where you honestly don't know how to proceed, you go to the advisor and you tell them. There is literally no point in just sitting down and staying there for months uh, uh, without uh, making any progress, okay? So that's really fundamental. And my advisors were uh, really beautiful people whenever I hit, uh, like everyone else, uh, stopping points during my, my PhD. Thank you. Very Sorry. If I can ask uh, yeah, you uh, something, knowing uh, who your advisors are and uh, that they are the toughest uh, people in the field, <laughs> probably, who was the good cop? Uh, ben, Ben Olkin. Yeah, I yeah. was actually interested in the bad cop. Did he like no, biking? No. Did he like biking? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not. In every movie, you need a good and a bad cop, right? Uh, the good cop and the bad cop were both. Uh, serve a very useful function. So you, you need them both. Otherwise, you just sit down and relax for six years and you don't accomplish much. So you, you need both. But, uh, but then you also need uh, somebody who can cheer you up if you feel sad or if it happens. It can happen that you cry in front of your advisor. I did cry in front of my advisors and it was uh, good that I cried in front of the, the good cop and not the bad cop. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it can happen. It's, a, it's an emotional and uh, professional roller coaster, the, the PhD. So whenever you're going high, you should maintain the expectation that you're not gonna uh, be flying at that altitude throughout the PhD. Whenever you're going low, you should uh, maintain the expectation that it's not gonna be that bad throughout the rest of the PhD. And the best way to kind of mitigate, to dampen the fluctuations between highs and lows is to keep an honest and transparent relationship with your advisors, which I mean, I don't know if I managed to do, but uh, at least my perception of what the job my advisors did with me is that they did a fantastic job at advising me whenever I needed to be cheered up or whenever I needed to be cooled down in some sense. So I really thank them from the bottom of my heart. But yeah, my advice for people who are about to do, enter a PhD or are doing a PhD is that uh, try to calm down, okay? Whatever is your status, try to maintain a positive perspective of things. Don't get overexcited, don't get over sad, but do talk to your advisor in an open and transparent and honest way, okay? Both uh, for, uh, for academic advice and also for personal advice. There is no uh, counter, uh, counter in, counterindication. Like, there is no reason why you shouldn't go to your advisor and every now and then ask them something about their life, okay? How they, uh, how they structure their time, what they do in their spare time, if they do anything. Um, yeah, you, you should do it because it, it helps uh, build an honest relationship and it helps uh, uh, to share uh, when you really need to share something with your advisors. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I mean, if, the, if, there is a, if there are any questions from the public, uh, I mean, the, we are uh, glad to, to, to listen. Um, anybody would like to ask something to Enrico and Jim? Okay. Um, hey, Gina, do you have other questions for them or? Uh, 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 you can uh, you can do your question uh, if you uh, have any. Okay, I, I want first to share a picture of uh, Gemma and Enrico. So here you can see them. No, what is it here? The day of their graduation. So a <laughs> few years uh, of distance apart. So the same, uh, the same, uh, at least uh, big room uh, and, uh, and some of the same professors. And uh, yeah, so, so my question for, um, for Enrico was, uh, so you, uh, you, was a, you were a student in NMEC 10 years ago, and now you are a member of the faculty. So what are the main differences? Uh, or uh, so how do you perceive uh, the program like it was uh, 10 years ago and like it is uh, today? 
the, the first difference I perceive uh, relates to uh, the type of study and preparation that the students do. So the students I teach now, I feel they have a much better sense of what reading the literature means. Whereas back then, at least my own very personal experience, I don't know how much this applies to my um, LMAC classmates, but my personal experience was that we were uh, basically 100% focused on uh, doing the problem sets and preparing for the exams. Whereas now, maybe because the classes, the exams themselves changed, but my perception is that the students do interact with the literature uh, much more than at least uh, what I did uh, back then. So that's a, uh, a big difference. I, I don't know, I wouldn't characterize it in this. I'm almost certainly a very positive difference, but I don't wanna characterize it as good or bad. I'm just saying, I'm actually uh, quite uh, surprised to see how good students are at um, recognizing empirical techniques or at uh, reading papers even though nobody uh, has ever uh, taught them how to read or how to skim papers. So that, uh, that, that's a very big difference. I remember when I used to read papers um, and I was an LMX student, I would actually read them entirely from the very first line in the abstract through the very last line in the appendix Z. And uh, it was uh, obviously a very inefficient process that would take uh, years to complete. In fact, I don't even know if I ever read an, uh, an entire paper during the LMAC but the students now do seem to have a better sense of what reading a paper actually means, which actually doesn't mean that they should scheme and uh, look for, uh, for, uh, for content rather than reading uh, the entirety of the paper. Um, yeah, that's the, the, the key difference that I noticed. Okay, yeah. thank you. And uh, a very last question for, for Gemma. So we learned that uh, Enrico had a few sad moments during the, the PhD. And can you remember as well some good and uh, a bad moment in LMAC or in your PhD that uh, you would like to share with us? Actually, when Enrico was talking, I was really thinking that uh, I identify a lot with what he said uh, in terms of uh, the PhD being a lot a roller coaster with moments in which you feel uh, some moments in which you feel high <laughs> and a lot of moments in which uh, you think oh my god this is a disaster there is no way out uh so i think and i also had the, the experience of having an advisor that was quite direct he's actually famous for it is ex uh, israeli uh, mossad is <laughs> super direct uh, type of guy uh so i did have uh i would say my low moments are the ones in which my advisor basically told me okay this research cancel everything <laughs> start from scratch uh so those were really brutal moments for me uh and the best uh, moments in terms i mean of course the phd is something that lasts six years so you know i uh, there were very good moments in my personal life um but from uh, the academic point of view i think uh, um the a really good moment is when you realize that the research you have makes sense to other people and is interesting to other people i think this is uh a super important recognition at some point uh, that you realize that uh, it's not all in your head that uh, it makes sense to others um so this uh, this i would say was the biggest satisfaction and for the for the lmac uh, i think both the best and the worst moments were the problem sets <laughs> that i worked on together with my classmates i was lucky to have a, a court that was uh, you know quite united i had good friends in it uh, and we were working a lot of hours on these problem sets together, and it was both a torture and uh, something that I remember forever. So I would say that. Okay, thank you so much. I don't know whether Camilla and uh, Eugenia have uh, other questions. I have another question for Gemma. Since she mentioned the fact that she has received a PhD in uh, political science, I wanted to ask a personal question. If I am particular and I and I want to do a PhD, uh, what what are the criteria to choose uh, between an economic and political science uh, uh, PhD? Also, from uh, a job market point of view, I mean, not only the the course, but uh, also after it, uh, not uh, concerning only academia, but uh, also institution or different kind of uh, path? That's a very good question. And it's also a clever point of view that you asked me to talk also about the prospects afterwards. Um, so I think there are 
different advantages in doing a PhD in political science. One uh, is what I was saying before, which is that you're more free to choose uh, which courses to take. So if you have a pretty clear idea of what type of research you want to do, I think it's an advantage because you have a bit more time to focus on actual research and to specialize in the things that you care about. So for example, I could, I already my second year, I had a, a paper that was a R&R and that's because I didn't have to do the sequence and I could focus on, uh, you know, taking courses that were actually relevant to my research. So from this point of view, I think um, that's a big advantage. It's also, um, I would say, a, a PhD in political science is a bit less uh, um, focused only on uh, methods uh, and it gives you a more broad perspective on the literature. Um, which is something that I really appreciated and uh, I loved studying. But then once you get on the market, there are less jobs. So you should be aware of it. It's much more competitive to find a job in academia in political science. Um, so that's a big minus. Uh, and also in terms of uh, prospects outside uh, of academia, um, Actually, on that, I don't think there is a big difference right now, because today, at least the, you know, the good PhDs in political science teach you about the same skills in terms of computer science that you need to have uh, for a PhD in economics. And so uh, a lot of the outside options are things that involve using this type of uh, methods. So, you know, a lot of people from political science go to Facebook, Amazon. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm in the Silicon Valley, so I know a lot of, <laughs> of people that do that. Uh, and those are good jobs and they, they require basically, uh, you know, data science skills. So I think um, outside of academia, from this point of view, is not super, super different. Uh, but in academia, it's a bit harder. Very much. And so just one thing, if anybody is interested in uh, having more information specifically about applying in political science, uh, I would really be happy to, you know, to talk more. Write me in private and we can talk more about it. Okay, uh, thank you. If uh, there are no any other questions, so uh, I would like to thanks uh, both of you because I mean we received a lot of uh, takeaways and now we need time to think about it and um, so thanks and uh, also if you, if you wrote if you already written your email uh, I'm sure uh, we can continue to keep in touch and uh, so if uh, another question and um, I can uh, leave the floor to Francesca if uh, uh, we want to continue with the um, with the schedule. Okay, thank you, thank you, Eugenio, thank you, Camilla, and again, thank you to Gemma and Enrico. So now we are moving closer to the end. Uh, so I still have to show you a couple of uh, slideshows. So one has been prepared by Federico Lenti, who is here, and uh, I. I thanks uh, a lot and also uh, so I received the help from his classmates so I see Luca and many other of them and uh, and also a second slide show that I prepared uh, using all the pictures uh, and images that uh, you were so kind to send me in the past uh, weeks uh, and uh, remember that uh, afterward we will have uh, four uh, breakout rooms uh, in which uh, uh, Federica Meluzzi, Vittoria Zoli, Danny Tomasi and uh, Pietro Dallara will be available to discuss uh, with uh, people interested in having information about uh, different uh, paths after uh, LMEC. So Danny Tomasi will take care of PhD in uh, Europe, Pietro uh, PhD in the USA, Federica public institution and uh, Victoria private institutions. So, so you will be able to uh, join uh, the uh, breakout rooms uh, just uh, um, and just uh, uh, choosing uh, the one that you prefer. Uh, 